A local institution holds precious pieces of paper belonging to the biggest selling music artists of all time. We recently took a rare look at this collection of cultural artifacts. Paris Schutz has the story. As a touring band, the Beatles visited Chicago three times to play at two Southside venues that no longer exist. The International Amphitheater in 1964 and 1966 and Comiskey Park in 1965. But in a way, the Fab Four never really left the Chicago area. That's because the personal handiwork of John Lennon and Paul McCartney resides at Northwestern University's Music Library in Evanston. Sure, we're looking at what we call the Beatles manuscripts. We have seven lyric sheets of some very well-known Beatles songs from the Revolver Rubber Soul period. Specifically, the library holds the original lyric sheets for six songs from the 1966 album Revolver. Eleanor Rigby, I'm Only Sleeping, Yellow Submarine, Good Day Sunshine, And Your Bird Can Sing, and For No One, as well as the lyrics for The Word from 1965's Rubber Soul. Northwestern is one of just two libraries in the world which possess handwritten Beatles lyrics. The other is the British Library, the United Kingdom's National Library. There are a lot of lyric sheets like this out there, but they're held in private hands. In the mid-1960s, American composer John Cage was amassing hundreds of manuscripts from composers around the world. Cage already knew Yoko Ono and asked for her help. With his friendship with Yoko Ono, he said, hey, would it be possible if we had some Beatles things for this project? So she was able to, to uh, get these from the Beatles and give them to Cage. Identified as an institution with a robust music library, Northwestern was gifted the Beatles manuscripts by Cage in 1973. Beatles historian and author Robert Rodriguez was utterly amazed by the artifacts. I haven't been doing the Beatles stuff for as long as I had. I didn't expect to have the reaction when I was in their physical presence that I did. But I could feel my heart beating faster. I mean, it was like getting a letter from Abraham Lincoln or something. One thing that stands out is the ordinary and unconventional forms of stationery Lennon and McCartney scrawled their pop masterpieces onto. That's an envelope John had written in the back of a bill that he found in his car. Um, another envelope. And these here that are taken from spiral notebooks. It really speaks to the fact that the Beatles were working on the fly. These songs emerged from a pivotal period when the Beatles were evolving from touring pop stars to sophisticated songwriters in the studio. Playing the part of pop psychologist, Rodriguez distinguishes between Lennon and McCartney's writing. You can definitely tell John's handwriting is distinct from Paul's. John Lennon seemed to be mostly aware of himself and living in his own head always and didn't necessarily think in terms of presentation. Whereas Paul, you always get sort of a self-consciousness aspect to him. So it's possible in the handwriting of these, he might be thinking someday somebody's going to look at this, even if it's the next day when they're in the studio. Yeah, as opposed to John who's just getting what's in his head onto paper. But distinctive styles didn't stop collaboration. Eleanor Rigby. It was George that came up with the, the refrain of, ah, look at all the lonely people. It was Ringo that came up with the plot point of Father Mackenzie darning his socks in the night. Along with discarded lyrics, doodles, and chord notations, the lyric sheets display the group's well-known wit. Well, what we do know about Yellow Submarine, Paul wrote it as a kid's song for Ringo to sing, but you also see some lines that ended up in the final song scratched out, and little notations, disgusting, see me like a school teacher would write on something being handed in by a student. That's something I would love to know. What was disgusting and who needed to see whom about that? And some musical markings on Good Day Sunshine may be sarcastic. The lads from Liverpool had no formal musical training. You get the sense they're being ironic there, throwing around music lingo that they don't understand. And especially because it begins forte, fortas, that's not a musical term, and then <laughs> Fortissimos, also not a musical term. Visually, one of the songs stands out from the rest. The word, Paul did the artwork, but it's pretty certain it's John's handwriting for the lyrics themselves. The word, the word is love. Not typical pop band stuff of the mid-60s, but here it is. And it also clearly physically stands out as being the most colorful of the lot. By his own admission, the doodler was under the influence. 
In his official 1997 biography, Many Years From Now, McCartney says, We smoked a bit of pot. Then we wrote out a multicolored lyric sheet, the first time we'd ever done that. Paul was a, a huge consumer of, of weed throughout the duration of his working years. And, um, you know, you get high, you got a handful of markers, you're going to do stuff. While you can't see the originals in person, Northwestern does have high-quality scans of the lyric sheets on permanent display. McHale says Northwestern owns the manuscripts and plans to hold on to them forever. That's a wise decision, according to Rodriguez. This is a very important piece of our cultural history residing for all time in Chicago. You know, the power of the Beatles story, it appeals to every demographic, and you can't quantify it. Yeah, they made good music, they had charisma, they influenced haircuts and style. It's bigger than that. If there's such thing as being touched by the hand of God, they were it. For Chicago Tonight, this is Paris Schutz. You don't know what it's like to... So how much are those Beatles manuscripts worth? Northwestern Library says altogether the seven original lyric sheets could fetch anywhere from 7 to 15 million dollars based on previous auction sales.